I'd like to introduce our host and psychotherapist for the series, I Am Not Okay, Kim Christing. Kim is the founder and executive director of Bay Ridge Counseling Centers and Human Strong, which is part of the Bay Ridge Circle of Care. He is an author and creator of several mental health programs in the area of mood disorder and anger management. For several years, Kim hosted a call-in national talk show called Nightlight and has appeared on numerous national talk shows speaking to the issues of mental health and relationships. Over his 40-year career, Kim has intimately worked with thousands of individuals, couples, and families to help navigate the challenges of mental, emotional, and relational health. Please welcome Kim Christie. Thank you so much, Amy. Uh, We want to welcome our two guests uh, for today, Dave Hutchison. Dave is a retired former professional ice hockey defenseman who played for the Philadelphia Blazers and the Vancouver Blazers of the World Hockey Association, plus the Los Angeles Kings, the Toronto Maple Leafs, Chicago Blackhawks, and New Jersey Devils of the NHL. He was noted for his aggressive, hard-nosed defensive play more than his offensive prowess. He often played in a defensive tandem with defensemen such as Dory Salming and Doug Wilson. He was chosen 36 overall by the Los Angeles Kings in this 1972 NHL amateur draft, but chose to play for the Philadelphia Blazers and the Vancouver Blazers of the World Hockey Association for two seasons. In 1974, Hutchinson finally joined the Kings and began a 10-year career almost exclusively in the NHL. He retired in 1984. Our second guest is Joe Tilly. Joe Tilly is the retired sports anchor for CTV News Toronto. Joe had a successful career as an amateur boxer, Golden Gloves champion, three-time Alberta welterweight champion, and bronze medal champion uh, at the 1978 Canadian Championship. Since signing on as the 11.30 p.m. sports anchor in 1984, Joe has developed a dedicated audience and viewership that is attributable to his enthusiastic and energetic on-air style. He was well known for his program features that include Swiss Picks and the Excellent Sports Adventure. Joe now hosts an online show called Joe Tilly's Great Canadian Sports Show. Welcome, Joe and Dave, to I'm Not Okay, looking at the tough exterior of of men and men in sports. Lasting 60 minutes in a fast-moving, hard-hitting NHL game is tough enough, but to grind out over 10 years, that takes another level of toughness. To last one round in a ring with a high-level boxer is difficult, but to be a Golden Glove champion, you better be able to take a punch and deliver the haymaker. Our guests have had an athletic career in professional sports in roles of being a tough guy. Tough guys in a harsh, demanding sporting world. How did they handle the pressure, the taxing testing, the unbending competition, the hard-headed determination to be able to face the next new young tough guy trying to knock you off your block? Gentlemen, I'm so delighted that that you are joining us today. And uh, I would like to talk with you about this whole aspect of men, toughness, the exterior aspect of toughness and what that means to our our inner world and our emotional and mental health in, in terms of that. So um, let me just begin. Uh, uh, did you guys see yourself as a tough guy? Not when I was a child growing up and playing hockey. I just wanted to play. But then the, uh, the game, <clears throat> pardon me, evolved into a tougher game. And I realized if I was going to uh, pursue the career that I wanted, I was going to have to adapt to that style and it was going to make me more effective. And uh, when I mean, when I say that, I mean, uh, when, when the other team knew that you were uh, a little dangerous, if you will, out there, uh, they would give you more room. In other words, the puck went back into my corner. I'd have a little bit more room to go get it because the guy wasn't right on my tail. Like they would be on uh say maybe a guy that they knew wasn't as aggressive as I was. 
So that gave you some space and you realized that uh, you got a little bit of respect and that created some space for you to do better in your whatever you're trying to do with the puck. Interesting. Yeah, that and the uh, the fact that uh, I, I, my coaching, um, I had a coach, Bob Pulford. Uh, you may remember him. He was a long time Toronto Maple Leaf. Um, yep. He taught me how to play defense. And one of the uh, one of the things that really stuck with me was that uh, I was only allowed to handle the puck for one second, one second. So that means that meant that I had to know where I was going to go with that puck before it even got to me. So my eyes were like wide open, waiting for the pass, but already known when I was going to get it, it had to be going up there to the left winger, to the sentiment or wherever. I had one second to, to handle the puck or I was on the bench. Wow. Wow. So, so was being tough then a conscious decision? Uh, well, you knew what, what I was out there for. I knew. And, um, you know, it's, it's not the easiest um, position to play that, you know, you're going to have to, you know, probably tangle with their tough guy on their team or, or whatever. And that's what it was back then. It wasn't uh, <clears throat> tough guys picking on their star players or, or weaker players. It was always tough guys battling with their other tough guys. Okay. Okay. And, and were you a tough guy, Joe? Well, you know, I, I wouldn't say that. My, my deal was that, uh, you know, I, I, for a few different reasons, I always thought that I would be, I could be a, a successful boxer. And, and uh, I regretted that I hadn't pursued it um, at an earlier age. So when I was, uh, when I reached a point where I was, well, 18, turning 19 and, um, I was in a pretty bad way. Like well, I was, uh, basically a teenage alcoholic. Um, and I drank and that was, and I partied and I dropped out of school and I was, uh, and all I wanted to do was, was, was party. And, and, you know, for a while that seemed fine. It seemed like I could maybe do that. I could maybe function. But after a while, I became depressed. I became, uh, you know, I'm really messed up. And I, I turned to boxing as basically I looked at boxing as the um, the last door on the last house on the last street. Right. This is my own. This is this is an option for me to turn my life around because I there was nothing else I, I could imagine I, I could do. I mean, at this point in my life, you're talking about somebody who probably had half a grade 10 ed education. Um, I was, uh, you know, I tried a variety of different jobs, you know, uh, but the only thing that mattered to me was partying. And so, uh, when I, uh, when I got into boxing, it was like, this was my way out. This was made for made for me to change my, change everything about my life. And uh, I, you know, I grabbed on with both hands, and I went right after it. And what happened to me is I, in in you know, knowing what I know today, I changed my addiction from drinking to training. And I uh, I would get up, and I, unfortunately, I had a situation. My parents, as the youngest five children, they're the only one left at home, and my parents were lenient and let me you know kind of have that uh, freedom to um, to live there for nothing, you know. And, uh, um, so I would go in the mornings and I would, you know, work out, I'd go to the gym and work out in the afternoon, come back home and maybe do some role work and go back to the gym at night and spar and, you know, get, uh, you know, uh, training from some of the, from the coaches there at the uh, native friendship center in Edmonton. It's called the native boys boxing club. And I, uh, I was, I took it seriously because it was, to me, it was like an option for me, a way to change my life, a way to do something with my life, because I felt like I was a loser. I was, uh, washed up. I was, my life was a disaster and this was my way out. So, uh, rather than look at myself as a tough guy per se, I felt like I, you know, I, I had fast hands and I, and I, and I wasn't afraid to get hit. And I, uh, I, you know, that was, I guess, the, the assets that I had and, and so, I was determined. Yeah. Yeah. So we all know how, I think how good 
It is for uh, young men and women to be in sports for all kinds of reasons, from uh, self-discipline, for some sense of uh, uh, resilience, for being able to accomplish, for, for rituals and routines that we can be able to uh, uh, feel good about ourselves. There's a lot of benefits for sports, et cetera. And so that, that was really helpful for you, I'm hearing. And uh, uh, you both said you could probably deliver a punch and take a punch physically. Was there ever a time, though, that you, you couldn't take an emotional punch? Have you ever experienced losses in your life that really threw you for a loop? I think we all have, you know, my, my uh, father passed when I was uh, 17 playing junior hockey. Uh, you know, that was, that was very hard. Um, Can you talk about that? You were 17, you were playing hockey. Was he, did he love hockey? Oh yeah. Yeah. He was uh, my influence uh, to get me into hockey. And he was the one who drove me to all my games and practices. And then uh, I was just getting into junior hockey and he passed of a one-time heart attack. He was only 51. Wow. And what it did though, is, is it really motivated me at that point in time, because I knew that uh, his wish was for me to make it as a hockey player. And really? that was that, that was when he passed, that was the driving force. That was like the fork that got into my arse to, to get me really motivated and going. And uh, I really kind of dedicated it to him. And uh, really? all of a sudden things started uh, taking, uh, you know, I was getting better. Uh, the game back that time, remember uh, back in the uh, early seventies, you know, the, the big bad Bruins, uh, the Broad Street Bullies of Philadelphia, uh, they yeah. were winning the Cups and teams were looking for guys. So I realized that my coach told me, he says, you know, start hitting. And, you know, if you like to, I like to scrap, you know, it's it's a little it's a little bit strange, I guess. But, uh, you know, growing up as a child and that, you know, I like to do it. You know, I used to box too, Joe. And and uh, once, um, you know, that kind of game came into play for me. Um, that's when I started getting better. I was getting more ice time. And uh, like I said, I was getting more room out there. So it made me my job a little bit easier, although it never is out there. But, uh, you know, they also put me with some pretty good defensemen that I tried to protect, if you will. And uh, whenever, uh, you know, the puck come to me, I just move it over to Borea Salming or, uh, you know, Doug Wilson, uh, Gary Sargent, these guys that uh, were offensive players and, uh, you know, let them roll with it. Well, That's why they became Hall of Famers, Dave, because right. you, my friend. There you go. There you go. Nice. Thank you. Well, and 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 uh, I, I I find that interesting that motivation that uh, pitchfork, as it were, and 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 uh, that sometimes losses really affect us and 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 move us internally to to do things that we might not have been able to do without that and uh you also were you not a a, a, a close friend of uh bob probert as well yeah but i never played with bob as uh, as a hockey player he was 15 years younger than i was but okay we met him playing uh alumni hockey bob couldn't get over the border so um, he lived in Windsor. I live in Dor uh, London area. So uh, he would pick me up and we go play most of our games. The bulk of them were in Toronto area, whether it be northern Toronto or eastern or uh, sorry, northern Ontario or eastern. Uh, so that's how Bob and I, I only knew Bob for, you know, six, you know, six or seven years uh, before he passed because uh, he died at 45. And, wow. um, so we had, yeah, we were good friends and, uh, you know, I miss him. Do you? How did did, it, did that affect his death affect you as well? Well, I you know it affected uh, all of his friends. Uh, you know, Bob was a wonderful guy, person. Um, you know, he had a, a switch that would flick in a hurry when he was on the ice. But uh, I never saw that uh, away from the game. I never did see him get mad at anybody. He was a joy. People loved to see him. He was like that big bear that came around. And uh, whether they were uh, police officers that were trying to bust him. Uh, hockey, you know, everybody loved the guy. And when we played these games, mostly we played against the cops. They were the first ones that wanted pitchers with them. <laughs> <laughs> and also the first ones that were arresting him. <laughs> it was quite a, it was quite, quite a fiasco. <laughs> Loss for you, Joe. Well, yeah, as, 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 as a lot of people know, I, I, 
you know, we, we lost our son Spencer to uh, a, a fentanyl overdose in, in 2014. So when it comes to loss, I mean, that's, you know, I, I can't imagine it's, you know, it's but as, 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 uh, as bad as it gets, right? I can't imagine anything, any more loss than that. And it's like, you know, when I, before that happened, I, a uh, friend, George Chivallo had lost Jesse Mm. Then George Jr. and then Stevie and and then his wife and and, and uh, you know, um, I, I I you know experienced some of that with with you know knowing George and and I've had other friends who've lost uh, children and and um, well, it, it was it was a, it was a, you know tough and and um, what I you know what what Spencer kind of indicated to me when he was going through. Uh, treatment and then aftercare program is that it, it, he had a desire to, to help other people and he had the desire to perhaps to be a counselor which is what i do today is i i work at uh, addiction rehab toronto and i and i you know i'm a, a part-time counselor there and you know taking people through recovery and and um now the the what I get from that is like I know Spencer want to help other people and I want to help other people and I find that by trying to be helpful finding ways to be helpful it takes me out of myself it uh, it gives um, depth and weight to that loss uh, you know like all of our experiences make us uniquely useful to be of service to other people. That's what I've learned. Right. And, and so when we, we experience loss and we're able to share that loss, we're able to help other people, <clears throat> other people with their loss. <clears throat> it's, um, it has gratification, right? It, it, it's gratifying. It's, um, it's good for me. Uh, I do believe, you know, in this, uh, you know, this idea that nothing happens by mistake. Things happen for a reason. Uh, there's a reason why all this stuff happens. And uh, so my reason, my reason, the reason for me being who I am and going through what I've gone through and on all that other stuff is because it puts me in a position to be u- uniquely useful to help other people. I believe that's what my, my, can I can I drill yeah. down there, Joe? Sorry to interrupt. But yeah. When you said it takes me out of myself, what is right. the, what's 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 that about yourself? Well, you know, uh, myself in terms of you know, sometimes I'll be in a place where I'm grieving, you know, and I'm 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 I'm, I'm down, and I feel sometimes I'll be in a place where I've got some self pity. Sometimes I'll 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 be in a place where I'm concerned about what. Um, what other people think of me. Sometimes I'm in a place where I'm, um, you know, f- full of self doubt or, you know, uh, anything like that. And, and when I'm, you know, working with another alcoholic or addict or, you know, helping somebody else in that way, uh, that takes me right out of myself. It puts me in a really good place. And, uh, you know, when I have the opportunity to, to be helpful, I really enjoy it. I, I, I just, I, I love it. And it's kind of what, it, it's kind of what makes my world go around today. And, and because of that, I think I'm in a really good place today, despite, you know, what I've gone through. And I think when I stop trying to be helpful is when I'm probably going to hit, you know, a wall that, I, you know, I don't know if I can get through, you know, but, but by keeping myself, you know, focused on what I can do, how I can be helpful instead of weren't thinking about what I've lost, what I don't have. Um, you know, I'm in much better place that way. The, um, and so I'm interested in that more and more we're seeing professional athletes who are admitting more outwardly to that. They are struggling emotionally, relationally, psychologically, uh, from tennis players to gymnasts, et cetera. And um, in your looking back at your career, did you ever notice other athletes that were silently struggling inside, uh, but they really did not have a voice to say that they were struggling? I can't say that I really know any. Um, I think hockey players on a whole, uh, they try to be a little more macho, um, you know, when um, 
you know, when we would get a concussion back in, in our day, uh, nobody ever used that word. Um, you hit mm. your bell rung and uh, you got back out there. Um, the guys today that I see, um, most of uh, most of our the guys that I play with still are uh, strong. And uh, I know that there are some that are struggling, but most of the guys that I know that I uh, hang around with and so on are, uh, are pretty strong. And and when you talk about the strength, so you're really, I assume, talking about an internal kind of strength and a resilience. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. Because uh, and, and you'll see, uh, um, you know, hockey players will play when they're injured. Uh, they're afraid to get out of the lineup, to be honest with you, in case somebody comes and takes their job. Uh, but uh, they all play through injuries. And, um, you know, that's why they have these concussion protocols out there now, because they know the player is not going to admit to having a concussion, he'll rather stay out there and play and play through it. And that's what we did back in, in, you know, back in my, our day, you can imagine how many of us had concussions. We never wore helmets. Right. Right. And so, so there is a point, uh, Dave, very interesting point is that the players themselves don't even know that they shouldn't be playing. They don't know that they're hurt and they, they don't want to accept that. They just want to get back out next shift. And, and so I said how that's it, you know, so they don't even they don't want to accept it. No. That's is is. So whenever you talked about addictions as well, we talk about this thing that's very powerful denial. So professional sports, part of their 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 strength to focus on being successful or the champion or winning can actually hurt you at times. Is that, is that somewhat true? Yeah, absolutely true. Yes. Were you ever in denial, uh, Joe? Oh yeah. For a long time I was in denial. I, I thought I had, uh, I thought if I really, because of the fact, you know, I, I told you know, when I was you know 19 years old and I, and I'm, I'm getting into boxing and I'm, I'm not drinking, I'm focusing on training and I'm able to put the booze away for a period of time you know, until I hooked up with my old buddies again and went crazy and, and, but then I go back into training again. So I felt I had this ability to, to, uh, to put it down for as long as I wanted, but then it got to a point where I couldn't put it down anymore. And so, uh, you know, and, 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 uh, I would tell myself, and I'd look at myself, you're killing yourself. You basically, your wife's kicked you out, you know, your the job is hanging by a thread. Your life is a disaster. What are you going to do? Uh, you got to, you know, you got to quit drinking. I know I got to quit drinking. And I look at myself and I say, okay, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. But I couldn't make it from work to home without stopping at the bar every time. And so that was the, uh, you know, the denial that somehow someday I'm going to muster up the ability to, 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 to quit when I obviously couldn't. So, uh, you know, the, the, the evidence was stacked against me. So finally, I had to reach out and say, you know what, I don't think I can do this. And when I was able to say, I don't think I can do this, that's when I, that, that denial started to dissolve, you know. And, and, and uh, you know, uh, my show, I had Jim Thompson on the show uh, this week, and he was talking about, you know, that surrendering process and how important it was to come to that to terms that I can't do it. I just, I just surrender. Well, and, and you know, yeah. So with those, yeah, the professional athlete or those who are striving for such high demand competition and to winning that a concept of not thinking that I can stop doing it runs contradiction to what is actually required. I mean, I deal with uh, various people, especially from, well, whether it's businessmen who are, uh, who have, began uh, became a functional alcoholic because of business luncheons they were required to do or from uh, police officers and firefighters who are meeting afterwards who who are are drinking constantly to cope with PTSD or or the challenges of their job and um, but for them to come to a place of I don't think I can do this do you think people come there on t without them suffering some significant loss? I mean, 
Do you see any people saying, yeah, I need to be smart and not uh, continue down this road because, uh, yeah, I, I, I may be able to do it, but I probably shouldn't. I don't know. Most, it's just, most of the people that I know that are, have uh, drinking problems or drug problems are liars. They don't, they completely lie to you about, uh, you know, how much they're drinking or how much they're, what drugs they're taking or doing. And uh, that's the sad part. That's the real, real sad part. I had a, uh, a real good friend of mine, Dan Maloney, another tough guy uh, that passed away here a couple of years ago uh, and the booze got him. And he was, uh, he was away for a while. Uh, his family had put him in an inst like not an institution, but a place with locked doors so he couldn't get out. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was in there for a long period of time, like years. And when he finally did get out, Took him seven, you know, about a week before he drank himself to death. And all along that time, he promised me, because I was kind of trying, I was trying to help him. And uh, he promised me, looked me right in the eye and lied to me. And that's the same with drug abusers. We saw it with uh, Bob Probert. And um, it's an awful thing when you, uh, you think you've got a really best friend, one of the guys that you really rely and trust, that uh, lies to you. It's the it's booze and the drugs. I know it's not them. It's the booze and the drugs. The disease, right? The disease, the disease is a, is a liar, yeah. and the disease will lie to me and tell me that I don't have it. The disease will tell me to lie to me and tell me that oh yeah you can have one, and the disease will, will lie and tell me that this time it's going to be different. This time you'll be able to handle it, and uh, you the disease will lie to me and tell me that. I can't ever have fun in my life again without it. Yeah. And all those things are lies, but I believe it. I believe the liar. And so I'm going to do and say, and whatever I have to do to say, and to say to continue on because, you know, yeah. So that's, that's what the, that, that liar, that disease that lives in my head. And I'm telling you, I would, I would, I would, I would be leaving work and say, I'm going straight home. I am going home and I'd pass a lie detector test and then, and then, uh, you know, I get on the 401 and I can't make it past the first exit on the 401. You know, I even tried changing the lanes. So I get into the, towards the exp express lanes and, you know, and then I found myself coming back to, because I, I just, you know, the liars tell me that there's something going on there that I'm going to, the fear of missing out or whatever. And it, it's all it's working over time and it's getting me it's getting me to the bar and it's getting me to the bar tool and the, the disease wants me dead or insane it won't stop until i'm either dead or insane and that's that's what and until i finally surrender and say i can't do it on my own i have to have help i have to you know be around other people who've gone through the same thing i've gone through and and have experienced the same thing i've experienced and they've got through the other side they've gone through that door because i just can't do it on my own i keep trying i keep and the disease tells keeps telling me yes i can but i can't but that doesn't that make you feel like a weak guy rather than a tough guy well but there's a there's a saying in recovery that it's, it's called surrender to win because if you really want to win at the game of life then you have to give up control and stop telling yourself that you can do things you can't Stop listening to that liar and stop being a liar, like Dave said. Right? It's just like, you know, you know. You then you get in recovery. You got you got some messes to clean up because of the, all the lying you've done, right? I, lying I've done. I had a, had a bunch of messes to clean up. So, um, I don't want. Nobody wants to be. Nobody wants to admit that they have no control. Who wants to admit that? But the fact is, if you're an alcoholic of my type, you have no control. And when you give up control and, and, uh, and, and, you know, and surrender to that disease and accept you know, that I can't, I don't have control, I'm never going to have control, I need to do what I need to do in order to get sober, and then I can have a good life. But you know what? I can tell you that the life you get to have is, is way beyond what you've ever had before. Every, even beyond what you can imagine. It's a great life, but it happens as a result of giving up control. And I don't want my ego says, no, you don't want to give up control. You can do this on your own. 
But I, I can tell you, I buried a lot of guys, uh, friends, children. I buried a lot of people who, who, who believed that they had control, who believed that they could muster control, who could gain control. And when, you, when you're an addict, an alcoholic of my type, you do not have control. And you'll well, never have control. Well, and but when we when you talk about that, Joe, and I so appreciate you being open and honest about it, to not have control. I mean, you guys, a lot more than me. I, I'm I'm not a fighter by by trade. Uh, very aggressive in in sports, etc. But I'm not a fighter. But you guys would go in there, take punches, give punches, and uh, but. When you are saying that to give up control, that's something you're afraid of. Well, what's control but a seven-letter word for fear, right? And why am I trying to control? Because I'm afraid. I'm afraid that things aren't going to go my way. I'm, th- I'm afraid I'm going to lose what I got or not get what I want. And so I have a f- I have fear, and I believe that somehow I've got to manipulate my exterior, manipulate the world to make, make it happen so that I can have what I want. And, and that's what control is all about. And, the, and when I can move from control and letting go of control and moving to, I got the Mike Pence fly in my head here. Uh, when I can l- let go of control and move towards acceptance, I'm in a, in a, in a, uh, a much better place. Uh, we're, we're all afraid, aren't we? Yeah. But the thing is, is, is what, what, I can, what I find is like, okay, if when I admit my my lack of control when i admit my fear when i admit my failure my failures when i let that stuff go and accept who i am you know what i don't have to fear anything anymore do i because you know rather than you finding out what i'm all about me being afraid of you finding out what i'm all about i'm just gonna tell you what i'm all about (laughs) there you go here's me yeah i'm an alcoholic i have fear and i have you know control issues and i have you know, deep seated fear of abandonment. And I have, you know, uh, you know, fear of you uh, of wanting to pr- portray an image of a person that I want you to believe I am. So you won't know who I really am because I'm afraid you know who I'm real. So getting through all that, getting into all that and, and, and you know, uh, understanding myself and then saying, but you know what, here I am. And right. you know what, I don't have to be afraid of you finding out who I am because here I am. I'm an open book. So if you like me, great. If you don't like me, great. Speculate the fear, etc. Absolutely. Right. And Dave, you know, when I think about the your your coach telling you to only have one one second with the puck, and you as a young guy wanted to play hockey, to not have the puck seems to be contradiction to playing hockey, and and you you humbly sounds like you were able to be humble and let go of control and say, okay, I, I am not that guy. No, I listened to my coach and uh, he was the reason that, uh, you know, he, he gave me longevity in my career. Uh, everybody wants to carry the puck up ice. Yeah. You know, everybody wants to go down the score goal. I mean, that's, that's uh, normal. But uh, once I, once I realized how I was supposed to play or how he wanted me to play, then it earned me more ice time. And, um, you know, I was getting into these better situations where, you know, the odd time the puck would come to me back at the point and it only took a second to get that shot onto the net. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, I found out that it, um, it, it made me a better player. So being able to accept who we are and who we're not, yeah. what we're afraid of, uh, and even being aware of it, uh, uh, that's that's part of the journey um, of of what we're talking about in in, in many ways. And um, is are you afraid of anything now? Uh, acceptance, I guess, from people. Um, you know, I got a I got a wonderful wife and family. Uh, five grandkids, um, hmm. you know, I, I fear for them. Um, you know, I'm still working. I'm, you know, closing in on 70, but I'm still selling real estate, trying to make sure that, you know, I felt when, when I retired from hockey, I played 12 seasons of pro, but I, I felt I, after I left, 
I always had that regret that I could have played another year or two. Hmm. And so I, that, that regret still hangs with me now in my um, other professional career in real estate. And yeah, I could hang them up right now. Um, I just, um, you know, I, I just, I want to make sure everybody in my family's cared for and happy. And that's my biggest fear. Does it, is that tied to the thought that you lost your dad early and now you need to make sure you take care of your family? There's a good possibility that that is because when, uh, you know, my father passed, we really didn't have very much. And, um, I was uh, playing at home and living at home because I was playing junior for the London Knights. And uh, I was fortunate to be able to stay with my mother. She would have been alone. And um, yeah, probably does way back, you know, way back inside there that maybe that is the real reason. But, uh, you know, I want to make sure that all my family are, are well. well and, so, and so loss really defines you somewhat. I'd say so. Because it was the, um, it, when I lost my father, it was really what catapulted me into uh, really, you know, putting my nose to the grindstone like Joe went through. Um, you know, it's got to come, you know, through your head. And once it did, uh, things started going in the right direction for me. And, uh, you know, it, 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 and as I look back on life now, you know, I've been fortunate and uh, pretty lucky. Right. And, and, and for you too, Joe, loss in many ways defines you. Um, hmm. So, um, I guess so, because um, you know that, that it, it's such a big part of me, right? It's a, it's just such a big part of me, and it's with me all the time. And so, uh, yeah, so that, you know, loss defines who I am in that sense. Um, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess what it, it does define who I am, but I want what I would kind of prefer to define who I am is, is uh, you know, is to be that guy who can be helpful. And, and I, I guess rather than it's not important that other people know that so much. It's just kind of that I, I know that and I experience it. Um, yeah, I, I guess. Uh, what are you feeling right now? Um, uh, I would say probably. Um, maybe a little bit confusion because I'm trying to trying to make sense of it all, and, and it's like um, I would say that uh, uh, you know there there there's sadness mixed with a little bit of fear mixed with a uh, you know you know some gratitude. I mean, so I've got I've got this whole kind of melting pot of emotions that that uh i experienced today that you know i think for a long time i didn't experience any emotion at all really i think that was what uh i think when drinking my my drinking was was a way for me to control my emotions i thought because when i drank i didn't have to feel right and it seemed like for me for a long time i didn't feel and, you know, and I it was, it was kind of like a sad, sick situation, but I, you know, I'd look at stuff around me that was like stuff that I probably should feel sad about, but didn't should feel happy about, but didn't should feel love, but didn't, I mean, just, just numb. And then when, you know, once I got sober and started to, uh, you know, change and, you know, I started to experience those feelings and, and today I do experience those feelings and, and I'm okay with that. And, and, you know, the, the feelings that, you know, you know, feelings like, like self doubt and, 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 uh, you know, fear and stuff like that, that, you know, they, those fears will pop in and they will stay for a while and they'll, then they'll leave. The thing is that I'm aware of that, you know, like, uh, 
like Dave, you know, there's a, that, that, that always that ongoing fear that there won't be enough, that I won't be leaving, you know, for won't be taking care of my family, and I won't be taking care of my, you know, won't be a, there's that that fear exists, and then I go, you know, what are you talking about? That's ridiculous. You're gonna be okay. How do we know you're gonna be okay? Well, here we are, you know, this date in September in 2021, and if I look at every day that's happened before this, uh, and I worried when I spent time worrying. I wasted my time because you know what? I got through it. It was okay. So I know, and I know I'm going to be okay. I know it's all going to be okay, but you know, still the, 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 the fear, the doubt, the insecurity will, will pop up. So it's, it's, and it's difficult for you. Thank you for the gift of vulnerability there. And, and both he is, and, and it's difficult for men often to even know they're feeling something or to to touch there because feelings. It's a lot easier to control a fight or control a, a puck or uh, or or be able to control a business than it is to control feelings that seems to come and go, and we don't have a lot of control over that. Um, but, you know, guys, whenever I think of how loss defines us, um, I, 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 for me and my story, so I, I lose my sister at, she's age, age 39, uh, two years almost to the date, her husband uh, passes away. And we're coming home from his funeral and my wife dies in a car accident and leaving us with four children. And so this concentration of loss and um, it loss is literally, if you're, if you're, our lives are a vessel and it's being scooped out and all of a sudden it, it seems like there's nothing left. Um, it's something else has to, to be in there and there's grief and there's sadness, et cetera. And, and I think the challenge with loss is, is that it, it is a powerful, powerful energy that can form and make us something brand new. There's a creative aspect to it that if we, if we are, have the courage to be a, an emotional and a relational tough guy, which, which means that we can accept and talk about and say what do we experience, we can actually become greater than we were. And certainly I, one of my regrets, Dave, you talked about one of your fears, your regrets is, is that the man I was with my, my wife who passed away was a shell of a man that I am now. And I wish I would have been that man to her. And I was even a good guy back then. <laughs> but I know that grief and loss can either destroy us or make us. And it sounds like for Dave, your, your dad really was, and the loss of your dad propelled you. Yeah, it was, it was a driving force. There's no question about it. So I look back on life now and I wish he was you know, would have been around to see me play junior or pro and uh, still think about it. But uh, yeah, it, it was a, it was a big, it was a big fork in the road for me. And um, you know, it was, you know, it was something that come from my heart, but a lot of it was right there. Yeah. In my brain. What do you think your dad would say to you today? Well, I'm sure he would be, uh, you know, proud of me. What would he say? Uh, probably thanks. And uh, for the hard work that, uh, you know, I put into it after uh, his passing, um, you know, I tried to be a good son for my mother and uh, try to be a good husband and uh, father for my children and try to give them everything that I didn't get because mm -hmm. of uh, losing him at such a young age. You miss him. Oh, yeah. What do you miss most about it? Well, when you're, when you're uh, 16, 17 years old, you really haven't growing, grown into a, a real man yet. So uh, I miss those times with them from, you know, 17 to, you know, 30 or 40, being able to 
converse with him and, uh, you know, get his ideas on things. Uh, you know, basically, you know, young men uh, being left alone out there because it was just my mother and I. At yeah. home. And, and uh, I had my junior, you know, teammates and players that you would uh, rely on. But, um, yeah, we is a big loss for me. I I think I talk to my dad more now. He's gone. And uh, I miss being able to talk to him as an adult and and missed out an awful lot of opportunities that I regret of of talking about him and his his young years, etc. And uh, uh, but I, I get it. You must have yeah missed that. Maybe that's why you listen to your coaches so much. Maybe. Hmm. Hmm. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you uh, for your time. Uh, I, uh, I appreciate being models for other men uh, that you, you can, uh, there, there is a, the, the ability to certainly uh, be courageous and, and we with athletics certainly uh, uh, honor and, and love our, our successful heroes, certainly back whenever you guys, you guys were out there and playing hockey, Dave, I, I remember those, those days and, uh, and so thought of you, you guys as, as heroes for, for many people. And, uh, the aspect though of that as life goes on, there's not just the ability to tackle the physical world, but more and more our emotional mental world is, is, is calling us to, to be fighters and warriors and courageous to be able to deal with the difficult things that, that happen in life. And uh, I want to thank you for your time. I really appreciate you giving this time for, for this topic. You are welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks, thank Kim. you guys. Thanks.